Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Matthew, VK2YAP, in case you didn't already know. Uh, my talk this afternoon is going to be about audio, audio quality and amateur radio. What are we looking at with audio? Now, one of the things is you go, well, this is communications audio. We're mainly interested in speech and we're mainly interested in communications. So what's the objective for our audio? It's, it's a different objective to the aesthetics of recording a concert or a rock band. The number one, I guess, objective for communications audio would be intelligibility. Can, can the speaker be understood? Can we get the speech understood and does the other person hear us and hear us correctly? So, start at the beginning. Start at the source. The source in this case is your voice. The energy distribution of speech changes depending on the speaking voice. No, a normal speaking voice has a certain distribution and it changes, the relative balance of frequency components in, in person speech changes depending on how you're speaking as well. Interestingly enough, the relative level of, say, high to low frequencies, the lowest components of a typical male voice are actually about as low as 80 hertz. Depending on the voice. My voice, the main formant component is around about 95 hertz, which is quite high for a male. Uh, female voices are often around about a little bit 100, 130, up to as high as maybe 180. There's more spread for female voices. So it's interesting when we, we often talk in communications about what the lower frequency limit is, that's actually a lot lower than I presume a lot of people would have thought. Certainly I was surprised the first time I heard it. There's not a lot of energy at that frequency, but that's the fundamental frequency. There are harmonics of that as well. And there's significant energy in harmonics of speech up as high as four kilohertz. When I talk about speech, there's, I'll, without going too much into the details of theory of how speech is produced, how sounds produced in parts of speech, there's basically two kinds of sounds. I mean, you talk about consonants and vowel sounds in, in an English language anyway, or English language, European language. But in terms of the actual sounds, you've got what are called voiced sounds and unvoiced sounds. So this is a very basically break it up. The voiced sounds are the pitch sounds. So in English, the vowel sounds are that sort of sound. The unvoiced sounds are the, the sibilance, that's in the all that sort of stuff. So as I was saying, what I was talking about before with that sort of energy distribution, that was mainly the voice sounds. The unvoiced sounds actually go even higher. There's still significant energy in, in speech as high as 10 kilohertz. When I say significant, we, we tend to think in engineering terms, you know, we sort of say, if we say the frequency response, we talk about plus or minus 1 dB, plus or minus 3 dB. Human senses actually have a much broader dynamic range than you might otherwise expect. Human hearing, I mean, your threshold of hearing in a quiet environment, reference to the sort of standard reference for sound pressure level, you're sort of down around about 15 dB above a static air pressure at 1,000 hectopascals, just as a, to pick a number. The threshold of pain's up around about 120 dB, so the dynamic range of your normal hearing is about 110 dB. That's actually, for an electronic system, you know, most receivers would struggle to have 110 dB dynamic range. But the one here is pretty good. If you're on an aircraft carrier and you've got planes landing and you've got things, with, things that go bang on the front of them, you want to make sure if someone says your headphone fire, that's actually what he said. They found that, interesting thing, a signal noise ratio with wideband noise of 0 dB. So basically the speech had the same average energy as wideband noise across a, what they call the word articulation test, which is where they have groups of words and they test whether the listener has understood what the words are, but they're basically random, so you're not inferring from context. The articulation is still about 40%. So even if your signal to noise ratio is zero, you can, your brain can still pick out about nearly half the words that are spoken. That's pretty impressive signal processing. The test was done by one of the research people, again using random groups of words, so that you're not inferring from a sentence what what it should be. Um, the accuracy with a bandwidth cutoff of, in groups of 10 words, so this was a very extreme test, but this was clean speech, this was not, this was with really good signal noise ratio, unlike the Air Force people, with, with, where they used groups of 10 words so you couldn't remember or try and guess it in your head. Three kilohertz, they were getting a total 
accumulated recognition of 5%. 6 kilohertz, 75%. And it only increased about 85% when you got to 15K audio bandwidth. So what it says is, and there's another aspect, which is human hearing. Human hearing is most sensitive in the region of 2 kilohertz up to about 4 or 5 kilohertz. Again, individual variation. So when we say that 3 kilohertz is good enough to reproduce speech, that's actually a really tenuous assumption. And when we've done some studies, and the most interesting one, I think I went back far enough, because I said to myself, where does this 3 kilohertz thing come from? I found it. Bell System Technical Journal, July 1938, from the paper. The desirability of designing circuits to transmit frequencies from 200 or 300 cycles, note even then, 200 or 300 cycles, up to about 3,000 cycles. That's the quote that everyone seems to hold as gospel from 1938. And even then, only the second bit, they say 300 to 3,000 is good enough for speech. Matthew, what are, you, what are you going on about? You're talking crap. Well, actually, he said 200. If you read the rest of that paragraph, he says later in the paragraph, justification in these systems for providing a somewhat, well, recent work suggests, just recent work, 1938, justification in these systems from providing a somewhat wider band from about 150 to about 3,500 cycles. Another quote from that one was that frequency limitation is essentially an economic one, subject to changes, conditions change. And this was in the context of this journal. The other papers in this journal were talking about the response of the telephone instruments in use in 1938. And the context of um, long distance cables and using frequency division multiplexing for undersea or long distance cables. So when we say three kilohertz is good enough, we meant good enough in the context of providing an economical phone service over long distances in 1938. Not good enough in that we had somehow reached a gold standard of what produced good communications or good intelligibility. Starting off with a microphone that gives you a pretty flat frequency response is pr probably a pretty good start. Um, positioning the microphone in a way that avoids P pops and hisses and clicks and noises of you sniffing your nose is a, is a good thing for subjective quality as much as anything else. But from then on we, we can sort of start and you know, not, not having a tiled room in which to set up your shack probably helps too. Reverberation is quite destructive to speech intelligibility. Another myth that comes from the old days is, oh, adding reverb helps because it gives you more power. And it does. Rever adding some reverberation to speech will increase the average level because you're adding some extra signal. I mean, you, it's an additive process. It certainly it will. It'll increase the... And if you're watching on an you know, RMS, a weighted meter or average meter, yep, the meter will swing up more when you've got some reverb in there. If your idea was just simply to get your amp working harder, well, great, it'll work fine. If your idea is to actually try and get through the noise, you haven't actually improved the signal-noise ratio of your speech. And what you've done is you made that really good signal processor at the other end work even harder to try and filter out not only the noise, but also some extra, extra speaking that's in there. So it doesn't actually help your reverberation much. Talking about peaks and averages and peak power, most transmitters we find well, basically, it's a fundamental limit of how our transmitter are peak power limited. So in SSB, we have a peak power in our transmitter. Even if we're talking about AM, when we're talking about full carrier double sideband AM, the limitation of the amplifier besides any continuous power rating that the amplifier may have due to its thermal or power supply limits is, again, a peak power one. It's the peak power at whatever positive modulation you want to run, be it 100% or higher. Unprocessed speech. Just if I put a flat, nominally flat microphone in front of my face and recorded something I was saying, be it what I'm saying now or something I recorded earlier, what would be, do you think, the ratio between the average energy of that speech and the actual peak amplitude, the RMS energy and peak amplitude? 16 is a measurement that I made the night, last night. I was recording a bit of audio and I thought, hmm, let's measure it. So when I set my peak to be, yeah, so 16 is what I got there. That was unprocessed speech. If we're in an environment where our signal-noise ratio is limited, and we spoke about signal-noise ratio, then, and we're also peak power limited. So my, my listener is limited by his signal-noise ratio. I'm limited by the peak power of my transmitter. If I want this signal to do anything that's going to be any way useful, I'm going to need to reduce that peak to average ratio down to a more sensible figure. 
that's when we start talking about things like compression and limiting and clipping. Now, another one of those old meshes is clip the hell out of it. Is that you can, and I, I even saw it in the ARRRO handbook. Speech is intelligible clipped 15 dB was what it said in the ARRRO handbook. And it showed this waveform of a sine wave that had turned into a square wave. And uh, I sort of thought, oh, okay. So I went back to my friends at Wright Air Force Base and had a look at what they had to say on the subject. Here's what they found. This word articulation test I spoke about earlier. There's a crossover. Clipping the hell out of it does help you if your signal noise ratio is bad. It does improve intelligibility. But there's a crossover. The signal that was very heavily clipped actually plateaued and in good signal noise ratio conditions it was, un it was still, the intelligibility did not improve. The intelligibility rate, the articulation rate flattened out at 55%. So clip speech helps you when it's really noisy but as the signal noise ratio improved the problem is the speech was now so distorted that it was actually hard to, there was just no way you could tell even with a good signal noise ratio what was being said. The biggest problem from that is that plateau occurs at a signal noise ratio of 0 dB. So if your signal noise ratio is better than 0, your 20 dB of clipping is actually going to do worse for you than having no processing at all. So there's probably, there is actually an effect of clipping. Now the effect there though is the effect when it does work is dramatic. So the signal noise ratio of minus 5, where the noise energy is 5 dB higher than the speech, the unprocessed speech was getting articulation rate about 20%, so 1 in 5 was correct. The clip speech was 50%. So that's made a big difference. So what does this tell us? This tells us that, well it actually tells us what we just worked out in another way, was that reducing the peak to average ratio of the speech means that we've got more average energy to get over the noise level and that improves intelligibility, which we knew from looking at the graph before, which was you know, what signal noise ratio do we need to be able to understand what's being said. Other things we do are compression and limiting. Basically, nonlinear processes where we change the gain of an amplifier based on some measure of what's happening on the input, like an AGC device. The, the combination of an AGC device followed by a clipper then is, is a useful one because that means that that effectively sets a level going into the clipper and that means you can then set, in effect, a certain amount of clipping to be performed off the peaks of the audio and then so you can get the average up again because you've set a peak limit but it'll reduce the level, it'll, the AGC station will reduce or increase the level of clipping required as the speech waveform comes in. Not only does the speech waveform have a very high peak level compared to its average energy, it's also asymmetrical. The positive or negative going peaks are often not the same and some people's voices it's very greatly asymmetrical. In the early days of broadcasting, they, they used to have instruments as part of their controls in the studio that measured which way the peaks were going, whether, whether a person was thinking which way or that. Because you had AM transmitters, of course, you've got a negative cutoff at 100% negative modulation. But as we said, the positive modulation is really only set by the positive peak capability of the transmitter, the peak power capability of the transmitter. And it was common practice to actually flick the audio phase over to make sure that the positive peak went in the positive direction and got you the best modulation. We can actually do a bit better than that with active filters, it makes it quite easy to do. Phase rotator is basically a kind of all-pass filter. It's a filter where the amplitude response for frequency doesn't change much, but the phase response varies significantly. What that does is introduces a kind of delay, introduces a phase shift between the harmonic structures, as I was saying, the formant parts of speech, which usually add in phase but are time aligned because they're all coming from the same part of your, vo yeah, from the same area of your voice box, which tends to make the, um, make the waveform more symmetrical around positive and negative. What that allows you to do is effectively that reduces the peak to average ratio. I'll try and dry, dry, draw that because it's a little bit abstract to understand just from an explanation. A part of a speech waveform can look something like that. So if that's your zero, right, so, so you've got a situation where actually, I mean, that's, that's probably under-exaggerated. Speech, I mean, I've got a waveform there of my, my speech and my voice, which as I've said in my experience is actually remarkably symmetrical, 
the difference is about 6 dB. Well, I said, oh, yeah, I've probably drawn that about right. It's about 6 dB. So if you've got, you know, if you've got say an AM transmitter that does 100% positive, 100% negative, if you set the modulation so that was doing 100%, then 100% would be there. I'd never get more than 25% modulation there. So I'm wasting a lot of modulation capability. Now, the reason that waveform comes out like that is when the harmonics you know, add, add in phase in a certain way. Usually, if you're getting an asymmetrical waveform, it's because of even order harmonics. We know that from Fourier analysis. So if you introduce a phase shift to some of your harmonics, which you can do with frequency, so a, a typical phase rotator has a um, phase response, which, you know, just second order response, just varies with that. What you're doing is effectively flipping over those second order components and trying to draw this. I can't. Oh. I guess it turns out like that. I really should put it through MATLAB and do a simulation of it all. But basically, I hope I'm explaining the point that once you've goosed up the phase relationship between the, the harmonic parts of the speech, you've changed the waveform shape to something that has less amplitude, but still has the same average energy. So you've done something very interesting. You've just done that reduction of peak to average ratio. And it's interesting because human hearing is quite insensitive to the relative phase of speech formants. 